<laughs> we have a story about the local turf war that is uh, happening in Maplewood, New Jersey at the moment. Uh, and the, there's a ballot uh, uh, going on for November 2nd. Uh, and I see that as a, a kind of like a case study for uh, for things uh, around the country, which is why I decided we'd, uh, we'd cover it here. Um, all right. So uh, as I said, that uh, we have with us uh, Patty uh, Wood, and uh, she's, uh, she's the founder of uh, Grassroots Environmental Education, which has been on the forefront of uh, uh, educating and, and warning about uh, various uh, issues with uh, chemicals in our uh, daily use products and so forth. She also has a program uh, uh, called Green Street Radio, which she uh, casts with her husband, Doug. Uh, on, and I believe it's on Pacifica Radio. Is that correct? That's correct. We are syndicated now. So we are... Um we are in New York uh, at on WBAI 99.5 FM, but we now are syndicated across the Pacifica stations um, across the country and their affiliates. Okay, so um, the day before yesterday, I uh, I look in I look at my mail, and I find this little leaflet, and uh, I I've seen signs around the neighborhood uh, against uh, the turf. Uh, the, these signs uh, look like this, no artificial turf. I, I have not been particularly involved in that. Um, but when I received this flyer, I really got rubbed the wrong way because um, it, it makes a number of, uh, of uh, incredulous, uh, uh, incredulous arguments. And the, the mere fact that it looks, the, the first second I looked at it, I thought it was uh, the anti-turf uh, uh, campaign because they copied exactly the same look and branding, the same color scheme, everything. Uh, and uh, that, that kind of threw me off for a second. But then I started reading it and on the back of it, it said that four out of five board members were supporting uh, the, the turf project. Now, this is a field... Uh, we have here in Maplewood that is uh, used by athletes and, and students uh, and uh, unfortunately it has been uh, flooded uh, a number of times had to be closed and the uh, usage around the year is not great in terms of a number of days and so uh, people have suggested uh, to replace it with an artificial turf uh, this is this is a uh, uh, kind of like a big deal. A lot of uh, a lot of back and forth is is happening here, and uh, there's it's a matter of great controversy. Uh, to let you know, uh, Maplewood, New Jersey, is a pretty progressive community. So uh, so this is this is uh, this is really like a interesting look at at uh, at how things uh, unfold. Uh, and and this is mimicked around the country, and I, I I'll I'll show you the playbook of um, these pro industry uh, uh, campaigns. So basically, the first argument this makes is uh, it has great access, a usable field for all will increase opportunities for year round use. Turf can accommodate twenty five two hundred and fifty percent more usage than grass. Now, this okay the. It's first of all, it's n not year round. It doesn't. It doesn't. You can't play on it when it's snowing or when it's a uh, uh, severe uh, weather either way. Uh, so it's not. It's not completely a, 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 a true argument here. But uh, let's let's uh, go to the second one. It has. It says enhance life of neighboring grass fields. Allow grass fields adequate time to recover and. Aeration while uh, reducing disruption uh, to practice and playing time for families, and this is this is uh, kind of questionable as well. Uh, but the third the third uh, one is uh, really putting putting reality on its head, and that is uh, it says it's environmentally friendly, and that goes with the style of this flyer, and it says made from recycled materials recyclable and used no pe pesticides fertilizers wasted water or noisy fuel based equipment to maintain now to let you know this is a bizarre argument because 
uh, what uh, this field is at the current time. It's an organic field. So there's no pesticides, no, uh, no uh, fertilizers and so on used on it. In contrast, if you're putting a turf in, you have to use pesticide, uh, sorry, you have to use herbicide in order to uh, prevent uh, the, uh, er, er, all kinds of uh, weeds from making this surface more slippery. Uh, you also you have to use water to cool it down. It's not reducing water. And, and the whole argument of uh, noisy equipment, you don't have to use uh, fuel-based equipment. A lot of fields in the area have uh, transferred to electric-based uh, mowing and so forth. So th this whole argument is kind of uh, uh, absurd. But this is not the first time that, uh, that things are, are being uh, misconstrued here. And I, I was going back uh, and looked at, at uh, things that were in the media. And, and somebody posted the local, uh, in the local paper, uh, a guy called uh, Madhu Pai, uh, who uh, put it this way, opinion, turfing the heart, the heart is the name of the, the field, the heart athletic fields would make map, so that's uh, Maplewood and South Orange, a truly progressive community. And he goes on saying that basically uh, this is the progressive thing to do because it allows for uh, less uh, affluent uh, community uh, in that neighborhood for uh, to, to uh, uh, enjoy sports uh, to a higher level, to a, to a greater degree, and it, it uh, enforces uh, uh, integration and so forth. And I found it astounding that, that this is being uh, uh, framed in such a way as if uh, this is, this is uh, the pro-synthetic pro, uh, uh, field, um, synthetic turf, is, is actually the progressive thing to do and the, the environmentally responsible thing to do. So uh, to, to examine those things, I, I uh, brought, brought in Patty. Um, uh, be before that, let, let me just uh, show you that, uh, that, that little uh, excerpt here that they say the township committee should be commended for their effort to bring in experts to address the health concerns that have been raised by community members. These experts reinforce that turf infill has evolved greatly in terms of safety and sustainability. They reiterated that there is zero, in caps, conclusive proof of negative health impact from turf. In fact, the very report cited by those in opposition of turf served to underscore this point. The often cited EPA study on the crumb rubber infill states that, in general, the finding from the report supports the premise that while chemicals are present, as expected in crumb rubber, human exposure appears to be limited based on what is released into the air or simulated biological fluids. So, um, Patty, what, what do you have to say about that? Well, that was a very thorough introduction into the, into the <laughs> current problem or uh, situation in, in Maplewood. Um, first of all, uh, there, there are several components to, to this. And so let's just talk about why we're why we are using these fields in the first place? Um, these are um, a great way to get rid of scrap tires. We have an issue not only in the United States but all over the world with an excess number of used tires. Um, they are very problematic um, for solid waste management as because of their numbers, because of their flammability, their indestructible nature. They also create a fertile breeding ground for disease transmitting mosquitoes. And so, you know, a lot of landfills will not take tires, used tires, and it's very difficult to get rid of them. So there's a considerable effort by the federal government to find uses for these recycled tires. And historically, they've been used for, for fuel. They actually have been burning them uh, for the paper and cement industries. They've used them for road construction materials, drainage fields, and so on. Um, but 
because the number is growing, uh, they have discovered a relatively new use for them, and that is to use them as ground up material, um, also known as crumb rubber, to cushion a synthetic turf field. Um, this was like a aha moment, right? For the industry, all of a sudden they're gonna get this incredibly cheap material to use in these synthetic turf fields that they're manufacturing. Um, so we use approximately 40,000 tires in, uh, in a single field. And when I say a field, I'm talking about a football field size field. Um, the exact chemical composition of these 40,000 tires is largely determined by the intended use for the tire, where they were manufactured, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But mostly a typical tire contains about 40 to 60% rubber, rubber polymer, 20 to 35% reinforcing agencies, and, and a lot of carbon black, which we know is a human carcinogen. Um, and they use lots of other additives, processing aids, plasticizers and softeners and so on. There are many, many chemicals of concern in these tires. They were never intended to be used in fields where children and athletes are playing and being exposed to them. How are they exposed to them? You know, parents will tell you that their kids come home with, you know, a bunch of these little black rubber, um, these black rubber pieces, these little pieces of crumb rubber in their shoes, in their socks, in their hair, and so on. This is not the exposure that we're most concerned about. The exposure is the volatilization of some of these chemicals, and many of them are volatiles and semi-volatiles. Um, and also the dust. There's a tremendous amount of dust that's created when these tires are ground up. And when kids dive onto those fields, especially soccer goalies and, you know, kids are on those fields all the time. They don't act like adults, right? They're rolling around. They are a different species altogether. So they are very much exposed to the dust and any of those chemicals that are volatilizing. Let's talk about some of those chemicals really quickly. Uh, human carcinogens, 1,3-butadine, uh, uh, cadmium, carbon block, fluorenthine. Um, then we have, uh, you know, we have benzene and the, uh, you know, the, the petroleum-based products that are in those tires. Then we have heavy metals like lead. Um, we've got uh, neurotoxins, manganese, mercury, phthalates, which I talked about. Those are the, those are the plasticizing chemicals. Um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, known carcinogens loaded with chemicals that we should not be exposing our children to. Styrene, a human carcinogen and a mutagen. So if you talk to any toxicologist or a researcher or a doctor that is involved in chemical exposures, they will say that there is no safe level to lead and there is no safe level of exposure to any known carcinogen. And these tires are loaded with them. So this is you know, something that's, that's number one. Number one is the toxicity of the, the infill material. Now we move to the second health concern that is quite obvious, and that is high temperatures on these synthetic fields. We've done a lot of testing on it. One of the first te comprehensive tests was done by Brigham Young University. They found that the amount of light or the electromagnetic radiation had the greatest impact on heating of the fields, actually a greater impact than, than the air temperature itself. So they actually measured when the, um, this the uh, a 98 degree day, 98 degrees Fahrenheit, and actually measured the temperature of the surface of a synthetic turf field, and it was recorded at 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Many other studies have shown anywhere from 150 degrees, 170 degrees, 180 degrees, they're all above a temperature where it is safe to play on those fields. The industry knows this. Okay, they, and I mean, the, the surface temperatures of synthetic turf are, can be higher than asphalt. And you know what it's like if you barefoot on asphalt, 
you know, you have to run really quick past the uh, over the driveway to get to the grass yep. so that you're not burning your feet. Um, so the industry knows this. And now they sell you water cannons. When you when you buy the, uh, the, the, the field, they also sell you an irrigation system um, that will cool down the field. And that usually lasts for about 20 minutes when it's a really hot day, somewhere in the 90s, like lower 90 degrees. So, Patty, um, that, that, that means they have to stop the game in order to, to stop, cool it? Yeah, they stop the game. They, they interrupt the game numerous times on particularly hot days to cool down the surface temperature on these fields. That's ridiculous. So what are the, what are the heat problems? There are, you know, we know that you have serious issues related to heat. Um, you know, we have dehydration, heat stroke, heat exhaustion, but more commonly we're finding that kids actually have second degree burns on the feet, on their feet from, from running on these surfaces. And this is actually through their socks and their shoes. They're getting these burns when the temperatures on the turf are dangerously high. So we've got all these, you know, these systemic problems with the de dehydration and heat stroke and exhaustion, but then you also actually are seeing burns on the soles of, of these athletes' feet. And that, you know, this will be confirmed. I don't know if you remember, but the, uh, the women's soccer players, the international teams were saying, we don't want to play on synthetic turf. The men got their way. The men's soccer players said, we are not playing on synthetic turf. The heat issues and the, and the other issues involved with synthetic turf are just, you know, totally unacceptable. And so the men all play on natural grass. And the women's soccer players basically this year just said, you know what, you've been forcing us to do this and we're not playing on synthetic turf anymore. It's too dangerous. Okay, second thing. Um, after the after the contamination from the the infill is is a body fluid contamination. So I noticed on that little card that they were not that they don't have to use pesticides, right? Well, the fact is that they do use pesticides, and it is in the manual when you receive your synthetic turf field and when it's all constructed, you're supposed to disinfect that field with a disinfectant, which is a pesticide. It is registered. Any disinfectant is registered with the EPA as a pesticide, not a disinfectant. It's, you know, it sounds less, you know, less scary than a pesticide, but a disinfectants are pesticides. And you have body fluid contamination on these fields that is normally on a regular grass field, okay? It's pulled down into the, into the soil, um, into the soil surface where you have microbes that take care of those, those the, uh, you know, the pathogens that may come from body fluid spills. What are these body fluid spills? Well, anybody who has played, played sports knows that there's a lot of spitting going on. So you have saliva, blood, sweat, vomit. All of these things are very typical on playing fields, right? Where athletes are, yeah. are playing, are not only playing games, but also during practices. So, um, they say that these plastic surfaces need to be disinfected after games to ensure their safety. However, in practice, this is almost never done, if ever. And there you go. And so what do we see? We see, you know, we see MRSA, we see other types of, um, of, uh, of um, you know, bacterial infections that are difficult to treat that go through an entire football team because they're all exposed to this, uh, this pathogen on those, uh, on those plastic fields. Injuries. There's not really a ton of research on this, um, but they do know that there is, um, that there is, that we do have good data that joint injuries, especially ankles and knees are more common on synthetic turf sur surfaces because it actually stops, it actually stops the, uh, you know, the joint. Um, there's a very new um, injury uh, and one of those is uh, is called uh, is called turf toe. It's actually a sprain of the main joint of the big toe. And it's very very common and very unique to artificial turf surfaces. Seventy five percent of the NFL players feel that playing on synthetic turf is dangerous, and it increases soreness, injuries, and fatigue. All right. I, I, I um, have a, a relative, a, a friend that lives in the West Coast, and he was telling me their kid was uh, playing soccer 
uh, and uh, they were regularly injuries because of the slippage. People were slipping on this surface. Well, they they do get very they do get very slippery, especially if they're not maintained properly. And you have to you have to understand that there are, you know, there are there are a lot of issues that need to be addressed on a regular basis if you have it if you have installed a synthetic turf field. Okay, one of the other ones that I haven't mentioned is um, is the whole idea of uh, of the, um, the the turf getting very hard um, as they play on it because they're you know their 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 uh, their feet are playing on this surface um, and they're pounding um, pounding the uh, you know pounding that 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 um, that uh, you know, the the pl- grass blades and the infer material down. So they're supposed to be doing a Gmax rating or testing for a Gmax rating, which is the ability to absorb impact, um, and that changes as the as these materials are more compacted. And so, we're talking here about um, about things like uh, like head injuries, like concussions that um, that parents are very concerned about, um, and they occur more often and they are more severe on synthetic turf if they're not maintained properly. And the way that they maintain, they're supposed to be combing the field all the time. And they're supposed to be replacing infill material on a regular basis so that it has that, that Gmax rating that it had the day that it was installed. And that doesn't happen. They don't do that. There's no maintenance of those fields. You know, They think, great, we're putting down this field. We don't have to do anything. We right, don't have that to is the selling grass. point here, yeah. We don't have to do anything. I'm sorry. Did yeah. you have a question? No, I'm saying that is the that is the selling point here. They're saying uh, we should just uh, do it so uh, there's no maintenance cost, and they're comparing it to the existing maintenance costs. Uh, they're like saying that's the fiscally responsible thing to do. Well, we you know we also have a very um, a very uh, deep background in uh, in natural turf playing fields. And we work with one of the um, the top experts in the country on that. And his name is Chip Osborne. Um, he actually did the National Mall in Washington, DC. He does a lot of university campuses, playing fields and so on. Um, it's a really pretty simple formula. And that formula is to, um, is to in this early spring, is to go in there and to, uh, is to aerate and overseed you're going to do that m- multiple times. It's incredibly cheap to do. It's so much cheaper to maintain natural grass than it is to put that million or a million and a half into a synthetic turf field. And you have to keep spending money on those fields if you're doing it properly. But if you're just doing aeration and overseeding and using compost tea, or, or compost tea is the easiest because it, you know, it doesn't take a couple of days to actually, you know, go down into the into the soil surface. Um, but um, that's really all you're doing. And you're using a, 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 a an organic, uh, non water soluble, uh, slow release fertilizer. And, you know, you can have a beautiful field like that, you have to aerate. So the investment for a natural turf field is grass seed, and a really high quality aerator and a compost tea you know, um, spreader. That's it. Yeah. Locally, in particular, in this case, uh, we had a situation where uh, the field uh, gets submerged in water, gets muddy, and that is uh, because of uh, bad construction. It wasn't constructed in a in a good way to uh, irrigate water away. But instead of fixing that problem, they're thinking they're going to just uh, uh, put a, a field, a, a, a synthetic right. so field. They're gonna, so they're going to have water on the synthetic turf field, a lot of water. It's going to flood the field just the way it flooded. And it will it will not, you know, recede. The water will not recede as quickly as it does um, with, with natural grass. The other problem is that when you have a flooded synthetic turf field, all of those toxic little pieces of infill material, all that toxic stuff is is moving off that field into the surrounding neighborhood, going down streets, into drains, wherever it's going. We have seen flooded synthetic turf fields make an incredible mess out of a neighborhood. 
unbelievable. And it's all toxic. So going into streams, it's going out into the environment where you may have where you may have sensitive ecosystems where you're impacting wildlife and and uh, you know and water quality. Yes, now, and we we're exactly. And you know what? We have climate. We have a we have a climate crisis, and we're using these fields that are made out of plastic, which is a fossil fuel product, and they're not absorbing CO two. A huge synthetic. I mean, a huge football field made from natural grass mm -hmm. is a carbon sink, right? It's yeah. absorbing. It's it it's it's taking in carbon carbon dioxide out of the air. And Once water. you put down yeah. that plastic mat. It's over. You have lost that very valuable, you know, large area of, um, you know, of carbon capture. Which it's is at great. least neutral, and, yeah. and and artificial turf certainly isn't. I mean, plastic Absolutely. is made out of natural gas. Yeah, and you know what? It's really, really expensive to get rid of these fields. New York State's Department of Environmental Conservation has not figured out where to put them yet because the landfills don't want them because of the hazardous waste product, meaning the, the tire waste, right? These, these little pieces of, uh, of infill material, they're not quite sure what to do with them. In Europe, what they do on these, on these fields, these synthetic fields, they just roll up the old fields and they shove them to the side of the field. You have some fields in Europe where they have like three or four old artificial turf fields just rolled up on the side of the field because so there's nowhere right. to go with them nobody wants them this yeah. is plastic right and, and the are the, the, th and i sorry, think the sorry. european laws would uh, uh wouldn't allow uh to uh to use this stuff you know because we got we are very strict with this what this concerns well the, the i mean uh, we know that there's synthetic turf there we have synthetic turf fields in italy we have synthetic turf fields in france there they they are using it in other countries not as much as they are, as we are using it here in the United States. And I think not next to next to uh, 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 growing fields for uh, vegetables and stuff. You know, oh, I think there, not. There, there's also a, a distance which uh, they have to keep in. Right. Yeah. And not only does it not does it not absorb carbon, it's not a carbon sink, but it it appears dark when it's photographed from the air because the black crumb because of the black crumb rubber infill and it's just like a tar roof it contributes to the heat island effect so it actually makes the entire region around that turf field much hotter and it's uh you know it's 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 a lose lose situation oh that's a big and, deal yeah, that's yeah. a good point you know a natural grass you know it, it consumes moisture and so it's always evaporating into the air and that incredible that cools things off That's right. So that, you know, yeah, you never have that. No. And, and you touched on an important point, the point here that they're making an argument uh, why it's, it's good for the environment because it's made out of uh, recycled material. But something to mention is and nobody recycles it after it's uh, after this use. Like so uh, whatever the field uh, is put in place, nobody will recycle that after that. There's no recycling for that. No, you cannot recycle that because it that would contaminate the waste stream. It would contaminate a plastic recycling waste stream. But keep in mind that less than 9% of all plastic ever gets recycled worldwide. Yeah. Right. We're just, you know, we're in a situation where plastics is a huge problem. It's a, it's a climate change problem. Um, and I just wanted to mention one more thing. And I know that I'm talking maybe too much. I'm sorry, but. No, it's not. absolutely okay. It's very interesting. So now the, um, they have recently discovered that these fields um, contain flame retardants um, as well as PFAS. So let's talk about the flame retardants. Oh, first. Hold on, Patty. Why before we, put them in? before we get we into that, we have, we have a whole section about the PFAS, but let's, let's just review uh, the, so the, the, the points uh, here that, that, that are uh, negative with the uh, synthetic turf. And that's, you mentioned the uh, injuries, you mentioned the health risks from the, from the chemicals. You have, we're, talked about uh, replacement of the carbon sequestration and the oxygen generation of uh, with fossil fuel uh, byproducts 
uh, in addition, and, and uh, also that there is additional resources that are not mentioned at conception uh, that will have to be invested in it uh, to the surprise of many maybe who are proponents of this. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, we're getting to the PFAS, to the release of uh, forever chemicals. We've covered that uh, forever chemicals on this show. Uh, there, um, besides the release of microplastics for the to the environment, uh, PFAS. Uh, and, and forever chemicals have a special role and if you've seen the movie Dark Waters this is, uh, this is the, the materials that uh, that movie refers to I recommend if you haven't seen that movie to, to uh, watch it uh, so it's, it's found in 99% of human breast milk at this point and blood samples around the world uh, at the current rate, uh, if, if we continue regulating at the current rate, it would take 40,000 years to regulate all of the PFAS chemical uh, uh, one by one out. Uh, and, and these are being used in food packaging, believe it or not. They're being used in, in various, in textiles, all kinds of places, and obviously in, in this situation too. Uh, and basically carbon uh, fluorine bonds, which is the basis for, for this, are extremely stable and they do not break down over decades. So they're going to be continuing to exist in the environment. They may be expelled out of one organism and then taken into another organism, but in, they're going to be in the life cycle for years to come. And what makes it worse of all is that you can't really filter it from drinking water. So it's here to stay. Once it's introduced into the environment, the existing the neighborhoods would would be uh, would be affected by it. Isn't isn't anything you have in addition to that? So you've brought up some really uh, in, important and interesting points. Now that the PFAS chemicals, there are over nine thousand PFAS chemicals that have been registered with the EPA. Doesn't mean that. Um, I mean, when you register a chemical with the EPA and you get an EPA registration number, you provide, meaning you, the manufacturer, provide to the EPA your own studies showing the safety or whatever it is you're showing. And it's like the fox guarding the hen house, right? I mean, it's ridiculous. And the EPA gives you a, a, an EPA a registration number. They don't have a third party you know, research uh, facility where they're actually testing those chemicals. Anyway, so um, let's talk about PFAS, but also there's three chemicals that are actually added to the plastic. So anti-static chemicals are added because plastic is, is very static, um, uh, you know, static, I want to say staticky, but um, players have found that, you know, they get, they get shocked from, from playing on, uh, on those fields. So they add anti-static chemicals as well as flame retardants, which addresses the high flammability as well as the increasing acts of arson vandalism. Um, so something that I saw a picture of, which really just was shocking, it was like breathtaking, was a synthetic turf field that some kids had lit on fire and the fire department was spraying with firefighting foam. So you have, then of course, firefighting foam is one of the, the major um, uh, users of PFAS. Um, so it's a it, we're we're trying now to to change that in this country so that we're using a a substitute for PFAS in firefighting foam. But in the meantime, here we have the synthetic this toxic synthetic turf field with these flame retardants and the toxic infill material and the plastic and the plasticizing chemicals, and then they're putting PFAS on it with the firefighting foam. It was like, oh my God, what are they going to do with that field? Where is that? toxic, toxic material gonna go. But the reason that they use PFAS in the plastic for these synthetic turf fields is because they're making these little tiny grass blades, right? To simulate a real grass field. And so they, it's, it facilitates the manufacturing process of the plastic grass blades going through an extruder so it's like Teflon, right? They, it, it's easy for Teflon to go through things. It doesn't stick. And that's why they use PFAS in these, in these fields, which just you know, makes them even more toxic. And you did a very good job of explaining the, um, the toxicity of PFAS. It, it, for, from our perspective, um, you know, it's an it's a extremely toxic endocrine disruptor. 
Uh, and as you said right here, how harmful is PFAS? So there you go. I mean, we interviewed a, um, an expert in, uh, in endocrine disruption or EDCs, um, endocrine disrupting chemicals. And we spent a good deal of our time talking about PFAS. So where is it found? Well, now we know it's found in synthetic turf fields. It's also found in firefighting foam. It's also found in all of your clothing that says waterproof on it. You know, you think, oh, that's great. Let's get this waterproof coat. No, don't get that waterproof coat. Um, in the United States, we actually have it as a law that all of our firefighters have to wear equipment and clothing that has PFAS in it. It's just terrifying. Anyway, so that's where we are. Um, and, uh, you know, it, and when you go to a, a store or you go to a restaurant and you take out food um, and, and it's in a paper uh, container, food container, it usually is lined with PFAS. Um, PFOA usually, and it's that it's that that kind of shiny lining that's to keep the food or the grease or the um, the liquid in that food from going through the paper. So there's a huge exposure to PFAS uh, in our in our water, in all of our waste systems, our soil. It's it's everywhere, and it's really problematic. And of course, when you're talking about a football field size piece of plastic loaded with PFAS, you know, as well as all those other things that we've been talking about. Yep. Um, for yep. the industry to say that these are safe is just highly irresponsible because who plays on these fields? Mostly children. It's right. highly irresponsible for and, the, uh, you know, for whoever is making these decisions and, and, to not you know, yeah. look do not look at this and go on to the website, the the, um, the website of the of Mount, Mount Sinai School of Medicine right here in New York City. Um, we have a you know, we have a, a lot of research going on. And like I say, um, the uh, the school has written a grant um, for uh, for study of these uh, of these chemicals and their impact on human health um, to the National Institutes of Health. And uh, this is, you know, something that you wouldn't do unless there was a, a serious concern and some good background information um, that, you know, that we already have on the toxicity. Right. And to me, to me, that by itself, just the PFAS aspect is enough to 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 nix the whole idea, because let's look at the impacts. So you mentioned the uh, endocrine and uh, disruptors. In addition to that, it impacts the reproductive system and the development of the fetus. So if you if you have a, if you're pregnant, this this may impact a pregnancy. Uh, it impacts the immune system and have been linked to reduce responses of the two vaccines in children. It makes them less less effective, the vaccines. Right. Um, it uh, promotes the development of certain cancers, for example, kidney cancer and testicular cancer. And it also was linked to thyroid disease. So all fun things. Uh, and uh, in in if you uh, you also there's a website uh, a British website PFAS free PFAS org uh, PFAS free org dot UK and uh, you can check things out there it provides much more information these things are real folks that they're not like some uh, somebody just uh, thinking uh, you know like having some some doubts or some uh, like. Uh, contemplation about this 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 is this is real stuff and it's been uh it's been uh examined uh it's been in court so this is this is not a fictional uh argument no. here and I, and the last thing i can say is that the work that we do to protect children because they are you know they are so vulnerable um and why is that because of their you know still developing bodies um, their lack of certain enzymes that, uh, that help to break down toxins. And pound for pound, they take in many, many more um, toxins in food, in air, in water um, than we do um, per pound of body weight. If you compare a child to an adult, um, they, are, they are just, you know, they are sitting there 
um, doing what a child is supposed to do with typical hand to mouth behavior and lying on the floor and playing on the grass. And these are things that children do. And by just being a child, they are disproportionately exposed. Um, and I wanna say that the that we um, we actually uh, were given the, uh, the award, um, which is a, a, a national award um, by the EPA for our work. Um, and it was an award for children's environmental health excellence. So, None of this is, you know, is just crazy stuff. This is all science-based information. And we don't actually work on any issues at grassroots environmental education unless we have a very um, substantial body of science and we know that that science is ongoing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so we have this on the ballot. We're lucky uh, that we uh, that we're even being asked about it. We have that on the local ballot, November second. Uh, but uh, this this gives you. I, I wanted to include this uh, on our program is is nationwide, but I wanted to include it because this is really uh, exposing the. Uh, uh, the playbook on this it's it's uh, it's unfortunate but the playbook is to cast doubt to switch the confuse confuse the the debate um, I don't know who stands to gain from it uh, if you want uh, a field that is uh, uh, year round to play on have a retractable cover on it but for God's sake don't don't uh, don't make this mistake and uh, turn it into a, a toxic uh, site. Um, so uh, we'll see how this uh, ends up here. I've uh, uh, set up a OPRA requ request and uh, required uh, to see the uh, uh, environmental study that has claimed, according to the article, that there was no uh, impact or no zero uh, uh, effect. Uh, and I will get back to you uh, when I do have more information. But uh, uh, at the moment, I think that um, uh, people should educate themselves and know exactly what's at stake. Yeah, and we got some comments here in chat. Uh, um, and uh, Bill Gabriel he's, uh, is writing that uh, he has his personal uh, experiences with this. Um, the Olympic track and field trials in Eugene were postponed last summer when the artificial track surface temperature hit 150 degrees. And uh, later he says, um, I was at a Eugene City Council meeting where the former mayor, now on the school board, spoke up in favor of artificial turf in city parks. That's what's first. That's what's got my inter attention first uh, on the subject. And uh, well, uh, it is. It is. It is. It is terrible. I know about the rubber problem um, uh, in Germany. We have the discussion for quite a long time uh, about uh, the rubber coming from tires, the nanoparticles which are in the air and uh, which are uh, harming everyone. It makes no difference if you're on a playing field or somewhere else. You know. Another question is, what does it with the groundwater? You know, if you've got such a big field, it also uh, has to infect the ground, the groundwaters, and. Uh, well, this also hits back to everyone, at least, you know, but of course you are right. Uh, that's uh, um, um, people who do sports and children mostly who are, uh, yeah, heavily uh, uh, concerned with this problem, you know, and uh, I hope you guys uh, get, uh, get, um, get the attention uh, um, that the people uh, w wake up on this problem, you know, that they, uh, if the, uh, such things are in plan somewhere, that they say, no, uh, we have to stop here. Uh, this is not in, um, in our favor. This is not in favor of our community. We got to stop this. And suffice it to say that the, uh, the issue is also that it's proposed in a neighborhood that is uh, less affluent than the uh, than most of the town, uh, so that begs the question of uh, environmental justice, um, and uh, that's been kind of they tried to get around it by uh, by present putting it on its head and presenting the positive social aspects of it. Um. Yeah, I you know I I just wanted to say that uh, we did a a, a really um great interview with Amy Griffin, who is a, a former um, uh, American uh, soccer 
soccer player on the American team, um, but she's now a soccer coach uh, in Washington State. And uh, she has been putting together a database of mostly soccer players um, who have developed cancers, especially uh, blood cancers, leukemia and lymphoma, uh, and from playing on these fields. And it's, a, it's an amazing number of, of players that we are finding uh, with this type of cancer. And I did ask one of the doctors that we work with at Mount Sinai, you know, what he knew about it. And he said that a blood cancer would show up sooner than a solid tumor. So he, she is working with college students who are in their 18, 19, 20, 20s, early 20s. And some of them have been playing soccer since they were, you know, in, uh, in third grade, right? So uh, this would be the right timing, the right latency period between exposure and onset um, or disease endpoint. Yeah. So that's a very interesting, very interesting uh, interview. And I might actually send you the link to that. Okay, so that, that would be great. Yeah. 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 So we have to be, as, as, as progressives, we have to be very uh, uh, media literate because things are thrown completely on their heads on a daily basis. We need to know what we're talking about. And that's, uh, that's a very important thing to do. Patty, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, the, your, thank your you. input was thank very uh, insightful. Yes, thank yes, you very much. Absolutely. Great. Thank you.